tonight. As Israel fights Hamas to its south, a Christian community in the north prepares for potential battle with Hezbollah. We want the war to come to an end, and we pray for that uh, purpose. Plus, President Biden sells out Radio City Music Hall, the latest from the 2024 campaign trail. And it's causing psychosis, uh, schizophrenia, mental health problems. Renewed health warnings as states look to legalize marijuana. All this and more tonight on Faith Nation. While the Israeli military targets terrorists hold up in hospitals, the question of what Gaza looks like after the war remains. Thanks for joining. I'm John Jessup. And good evening in Washington. I'm Jenna Browder. Fierce fighting is underway at several hospitals in Gaza as aid groups warned the health crisis, uh, the health care system is collapsing. That's right. Israel says it has killed around 200 terrorists at Al Shifa Hospital since storming the complex more than a week ago. Civilians also are sheltering inside the building. The IDF says it's working to keep them out of harm's way as the military targets Hamas gunmen. Meanwhile, the situation is said to be dire at other hospitals across the Strip. It's catastrophic. There are so many injuries. They have overwhelmed the capacity of not just this hospital, but the entire healthcare system that has been targeted and collapsed months ago. In Jerusalem, officials are working to reschedule a high-level meeting at the White House next week, centering on Israel's planned invasion of Rafah, which Israel describes as critical to defeating Hamas. Meanwhile, today, the Pentagon reportedly is in early talks to fund a peacekeeping force in Gaza after the war. The plan would not include U.S. troops on the ground. Well, as the fight against Hamas continues, the IDF is also preparing for a potential war with Hezbollah. Those living in northern Israel could soon be on the front lines. Chuck Holton brings us the story of one Christian village under threat near the Lebanese border. In this small village located in the hills of northern Israel, daily life continues despite the threat of war. Daily rocket attacks by Hezbollah keep the region in a state of heightened alert with fear of an imminent escalation. In response, Israel is launching strikes deep into Lebanon, targeting firing positions, ammunition depots, and key operatives. The Hezbollah have today also drones. They have precision-guided missiles. They have 80,000 fighters with elite unit well-trained in Syria, civil war 10 years with Wagner force with Syria, with Iranian forces. So we know that they are very dangerous because they have a very radical Islamic Shia ideology. Maronite Christians here have a long history of persevering through adversity. As they face the prospect of another war, they draw upon their rich heritage and the support of their tight-knit community. Well, we're still gathering in our church as usual, uh, albeit with uh, maybe a bit of a larger number. We are peaceful people. We pray for peace. We want peace. We want the war to come to an end. And we pray for that uh, purpose. The Israeli Defense Forces have evacuated everybody who lives between where I'm standing and the Lebanese border, which is that hillside right back behind me. It's only about 4.6 kilometers from here. And I'm standing right on the edges of a Maronite Christian community called Jish. The people who live here have not been evacuated, and if they want to leave, they can leave on their own, but they won't get help from the government to do so. And that means that the people who have decided to stay are trusting in the IDF and in God to keep them safe. This is not existential threat only for Israel. Hezbollah terrorists are existential threat to the Maronites here in Israel and to any other population in Israel as Israelis and to the Maronites on Lebanon, too, because they want to turn Lebanon to Islamic State. The IDF is preparing to protect people here if all-out conflict breaks out. With emergency shelters and essential supplies, Home Front Command is working to ensure the safety of civilians, bringing in bomb shelters, and providing refuge for those in need. We face so many persecution and oppression and genocide during uh, centuries in this land. And our faith is the only one who kept us standing in this land, in our forefathers' land. 
not giving up for any other foreign forces who are trying to submit us under Islamic rules. And that's because we believe in Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior, that told us, never fear, because I am with you. As rockets continue to fall and counterattacks persist, people here remain caught in the middle. For the evacuated, returning home is a dream that won't be realized until a lasting resolution can be found. Despite those challenges, the resilience and faith of these communities remain unshakable. From Northern Israel, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. All right, thank you, Chuck. Well, new CDC numbers show more than 100,000 Americans died of drug overdoses in 2023. And now, Washington lawmakers are debating a long-term solution to stop the flow of drugs from coming through the southern border. Meanwhile, federal law enforcement officials are stepping up their efforts to bring drug offenders into custody. National security correspondent Caitlin Burke joins us now with the details about that effort. Caitlin? John Jenna, each successful operation is a significant step forward in the fight to keep dangerous drugs out of American communities. A few notable drug seizures from just the past week include $1.1 million worth of methamphetamine seized from a Mexican citizen driving through the Eagle Pass port of entry in Texas, and also a massive cocaine bust at the Laredo, Texas port of entry, where $703,000 worth of the drug dollars worth of the drug was seized. Now, earlier today, we heard from ICE's enforcement and removal operations team. Over the last several weeks, they have been engaged in a 12-day operation looking to bring in 419 individuals who were accused or convicted, excuse me, of drug-related offenses, but were still at large. They were able to get 50% of those people, many of whom have final removal orders, which means that once they're in custody, they can be immediately sent back to their home countries. We've seen nearly 110,000 uh, drug-related overdose deaths uh, in the last year. And in this particular operation, based on, on some of those trends and, and threat patterns, uh, we felt that uh, this, this would uh, definitely promote public safety in, in the sphere we're operating right now. Some significant facts from this operation. Of the 216 migrants arrested, they have a total of 456 criminal convictions. 104 of those individuals have been previously removed for entering the U.S. unlawfully. And this operation covered 25 areas across the U.S., from Boston to Seattle, including right here in the nation's capital. John, Jenna. All right, CBN's Caitlin Burke. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Well, to the economy now. New data shows the United Kingdom joined Japan and Germany, falling into a recession at the end of 2023. However, the United States economy ended the year stronger than previously thought. The Commerce Department's newly revised third quarter GDP numbers show a 3.4% annual economic growth. That's up from the original 3.2%. Despite inflation, strong consumer spending helped to drive growth. And with that, let's bring in Mark Hamrick, Washington Bureau Chief and Senior Economic Analyst at Bankrate. Mark, good to see you this Thursday. Uh, so comparatively, the U.S. economy seems to be doing pretty well to other developed nations. What's driving American consumers to keep on spending despite you know, the high prices and, and really feeling down about the economy? Good to see you, John and Jenna. And it's not just doing well. It is the stellar performer around the world and really has been uh, for some time now. And to those GDP figures you referenced, with a strong finish to the fourth quarter of last year, producing some good momentum coming into this year, uh, we averaged better than 4% uh, GDP uh, per quarter in the second half of last year. That's two times the long-term average for growth. Uh, among the things that we have benefited from is the fact that we have a very dynamic economy. We're helped by the fact that we have been far away from the front lines of the war in Ukraine, where the impacts, including with inflation, have been felt uh, closer to countries in Europe. Uh, the other part is that uh, there was a lot of economic, economic momentum created by uh, lawmakers in Washington to get the economy jump-started uh, during the pandemic. And so we're still, you could say, benefiting from that. We know the downside of that is, of course, we have massive debt and deficits. But uh, we the outlook is that the U.S. economy should really hold up, and there's really not an outlook for a recession in the next 12 months. Those risks are seen quite low. 
to that, Mark, you just mentioned the stellar performance of the dynamic economy. Any concerns, though, that the situation in other countries might pull the United States economy back, whether that's Chinese stagnation, Germany on track for a second year of inflation, and now Britain, Japan, and others? Well, certainly it's weighing on the performance of international uh, corporations that are based in the United States. Uh, they would all sort of wish that those, let's say, rival economies were doing better, but we don't have a lever to pull on with respect to those countries. So the fact that the U.S. has remained as vibrant and as productive as it has, and as you said, credit the consumer in part for that as well, since the consumer is responsible for uh, more than two-thirds of U.S. economic activity. Uh, one thing we'll be watching in the coming months, of course, is when the Federal Reserve begins to lower interest rates, and that's expected mm -hmm. in the second half of the year. Uh, Mark, first quarter growth is projected to be around 2%. You say that still shows persistent and consistent growth in the face of deceleration. In just a few seconds left, explain what you mean. Well, just the fact that we are slowing down to our long-term average for growth in the current quarter. So a slowdown to something that's average, I would say, is quite remarkable. And the outlook for the unemployment rate is that it'll just barely get up to above 4%, having recently been at 39 all right, Mark Hamrick with Bankrate. Thank you so much, and hope you have a great weekend, Mark. Thanks, Mark. You too. Thank you. Happy Easter. Well, the commander-in-chief calls in his presidential predecessors to help raise the big bucks. The latest from the 2024 campaign trail, just two minutes away. Welcome back. President Biden is pulling out all the stops tonight for what he hopes will be a historic fundraiser in New York. Appearing with former presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, Biden expects to raise $25 million in cash at tonight's event in an effort to drum up donor support. If, if successful, that would put him even farther ahead of Trump in the money race. According to campaign finance reports, Biden ended February with $155 million more than double Trump's 45 million. Nathan Gonzalez is the editor and publisher of Inside Elections and a Faith Nation contributor. And he joins us now. Nathan, welcome. Um, so Clinton, Obama, and Biden all on stage tonight. The, the, the New York Times is uh, also reporting Obama's getting ready to do some more campaigning. Um, their headline today, Nathan, Obama fearing Biden lost to Trump is on the phone to strategize. Another headline from CNN, Obama jumps in to help Biden defeat Trump again. Nathan, uh, your thoughts on these headlines? and also this mega fundraiser in New York City tonight? Well, in some ways, this is remarkably normal. I, I think the Democratic Party sees that this is a, a very important high-stakes election, and they are bringing everyone and anyone possible uh, to the table to try to help out. And so when you have two former presidents who are, by the way, both of them are younger than both Biden and Trump, uh, bringing them, to, uh, bringing them uh, to a fundraiser, it's uh, it, it's. Uh, this is what the party should be doing. And this is in contrast to a Republican party where the past, pre you know, past living president or past uh, presidential nominees don't really want to have anything to do with the presumptive nominee and Trump. I'm thinking about Mitt Romney, Paul Ryan, George W. Bush. They are, you know, there is, there is not the same um, synergy on the Republican side. And I know some Trump supporters will say, we don't need those. They're the past. But they, that means that Republicans are at risk of not having as much money. And, John, you pointed mm. out those fundraising numbers. It's not just the amount raised, but what is that money going toward? Democrats are using that to contact voters. Republicans are using a large chunk of that money to pay for Trump's legal bills. You just noted the divide between the establishment and populist wings of the Republican Party. I, I want to venture to ask you about this. So this week, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. named Nicole Shanahan to round out his independent candidate ticket. I, I want your thoughts about her as a VP pick, but also the growing talk about his long shot White House bid being a spoiler in the November election. Well, candidly, uh, I try to be honest with you. Anytime I'm, I'm on the show, I had not heard of uh, of Hanrahan before before this announcement. You know, as a 38 year old attorney and married to uh, for a few years to one of the Google co-founders, uh, I think that one of the things that she brings to the ticket is money, and, and she can help pay for a campaign and pay for ads. And RFK Jr. needs that, mm. but she doesn't check some of the other boxes. I think voters want to know: Can this person? Um, can they step into the office of the presidency if something happens to the president? And uh, just, I, I think it's 
it's not quite fair, but the bar is higher for women, and I'm not sure um, that she that she reaches that. And I just, you know, or she might does she bring a particular constituency or state to the table that RFK Jr. doesn't have? Uh, that is, uh, I don't I don't see what constituency she's bringing, but I think he hmm. chose her because she he needs the money. Okay, we will see Nathan Gonzalez of Inside Elections. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you. See you guys. Well, it's legal in 24 states and Washington, D.C., with more and more Americans' approval. But some doctors and former drug addicts feel differently. A warning about weed next on Fake Nation. Welcome back. Well, come November, voters in as many as five states could decide on legalizing recreational marijuana. And according to a new Pew Research poll, a majority of Americans support the idea. 57% of U.S. adults think both medical and recreational weed should be legal, while 32% say just medical marijuana should be allowed. Only 11% say the drug should be outlawed. Well, marijuana may be growing in popularity, but doctors, parents, and former addicts are pushing back. Yeah, as CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson explains, they're worried about potential dangerous side effects. Johnny Stack grew up as a smart, happy boy in a Christian home. At age 14, however, marijuana use changed his life forever, leading to ultimate tragedy. He took his own life when he was 19 years old, five years later, after he became psychotic, very delusional and, and paranoid and suspicious from using the marijuana. His mother, Laura, didn't realize today's marijuana contains at least 10 times the psychoactive compound THC than it did 20 years ago. In my head, I said, it's just weed. I used it. When I was a girl, I'm fine. It's no big deal. And I was so wrong. Indeed, no matter whether you call it weed, pot, or cannabis, today's marijuana products are a very big deal. And the higher the dose of THC, for example, the higher the likelihood that you will end up with a psychotic episode. And that will lead you to end up in the emergency room department. Zach Plant's addiction could have killed him. I had you know, thoughts of other people wanting to hurt me, uh, thoughts of um, the only way of, you know, being safe was to, to end my own life. Doctors diagnosed Zach with cannabis-induced psychosis due to symptoms including losing touch with reality, hallucinations, delusions, and paranoia. Doctors gave him a stark warning. If you smoke marijuana again, there's a chance that you don't come out of psychosis. You go back into it and, you, and, your, and your brain may never recover. Studies show a steep rise in ER visits, especially where marijuana products are more available. As it became legal, definitely saw um, more um, delirium, hallucinations, paranoia um, as being um, side effects of this. And then even just uh, normal depression, anxiety. High THC levels can also cause severe vomiting, heart and lung complications, sexual dysfunction, and stomach paralysis. They would come in and have uh, long bouts of being unable to eat. Um, this would last for three or four days, and it was well known that it was due to marijuana. Despite the risks, more states continue to legalize. South Carolina, one of only four states where marijuana is still fully banned, is considering legalizing medical use. I really don't like it. It's a way to simply legalize marijuana outright. It's been a nose under, you know, camel's nose under the tent for years. We've seen this in multiple states. In Virginia, lawmakers voted to make it the first southern state to okay recreational sales of marijuana. The bill's sponsor, State Senator Aaron Rouse, tells CBN News it will give opportunities for Virginians to earn a living, start a business, and create true generational wealth. The measure is now in the hands of Governor Glenn Youngkin, who signaled he might veto the measure, saying, you want to talk about putting a cannabis shop on every corner? I don't quite get it. It's causing psychosis, uh, schizophrenia, mental health problems. I can't imagine he's not going to veto it. There's also growing concern over another substance known as Delta-8. 
Unlike marijuana, Delta-8 comes from hemp, but it can also contain very high levels of THC. Believe it or not, you can often buy Delta-8 at convenience stores and gas stations, even in states where commercial sales of marijuana are illegal. That's because the 2018 Farm Bill legalized hemp nationwide. It was like one or two hits of the pen and I would instantly be high. Nick Sauber discovered he could vape it anywhere because it was odorless and easy to hide. You know, I could do it in class. I could do it in the bathroom. Then, much like Johnny and Zach, Nick became addicted and considered ending his life. In my mind, I was trapped in this delusion of, like, I have to commit suicide because my parents are going to find out. After leading an anti-drug coalition for 15 years, Julie Killian found herself totally surprised about Delta 8. I was at a truck, um, one of those food trucks, and they were selling coffee in the morning, and you could get a shot of, of Delta 8 THC in your coffee. Now she's part of a major push to get rid of it. We're trying to work on the Hill with federal legislators about changing the definition of hemp in the farm bill so that that will then be illegal. Some lawmakers consider Delta 8 such an emergency that they're calling for it to be immediately outlawed. You do have some states like Wyoming, Florida, and some others that are working to ban them on the statewide level. They're not waiting for Congress to intervene. Meanwhile, parents struggle to protect their children from these dangerous and readily available substances. Ultimately, God's word says that we are to be sober minded. We are to be on the lookout for the devil prowls like a roaring lion waiting for someone to devour. And marijuana is one way to just sort of numb our children's brains. One other way that Satan is using to get kids to walk away from the faith. Talk to your kids. They, it, may not, it may not seem like they're listening, um, but I always feel like, you know, they're going to be you're, you're going to be in the back of their head and, and they're going to hear you. Um, so don't ever give up on talking to your kids. Lori Johnson, CBN News. And finally tonight, have you ever dreamed of working with NASA? Jenna and I, no, not so much, but <laughs> yeah. one group of high school students is getting a jump on their yeah. job applications. Engineering students at a private school near San Jose, California, designed a fully functional satellite which NASA is set to launch into space. This is something that it's not just local to Oakwood, like it's going out into the world and it's gonna make a difference and it's gonna show other students that they can, if they have an idea, they can do it. The satellite will soon be heading to the International Space Station. And Jenna, I looked this up. They were the only K through 12 schools selected to participate in this NASA program. That's amazing. What a way to start their, you know, their careers. Right. Thanks for watching.